welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. The Western Cape High Court's nuclear ruling has significant implications for South Africa's nuclear procurement process. Terence Screamer joins me to discuss the short, medium and longer term consequences of the judgment. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. Firstly, could you summarise what the court ruled on April 26? Yes, the, it was a landmark ruling. It came through um, uh, an application by two fairly small groups, environmental groups, Earthlife Africa and the Southern African Faith Communities uh, Institute. Um, and it was really looking at uh, the, the procurement, what, uh, South Africa's procurement of nuclear and whether it was uh, justifiable. Uh, procedurally, there were a number of issues raised. And the, the ruling basically found that uh, there were two parts to it really. One uh, on the international governmental agreements between South Africa and Russia in particular. The court set aside that, uh, that uh, agreement saying it wasn't just an innocuous document. It had some binding elements to it. It wasn't just a framework as had been outlined. Um, and also the process that had led to it going through parliament was questionable as was the process to, uh, to take the, the RGAs of South Korea and the US through the parliamentary process was also set aside. Uh, the applicants had said that it was just a smokescreen to allow to minimize the impact of the Russian agreement and the court seemed to agree. So it's sort of back to square one on those uh, agreements and I suppose government will need to put those in place because I think they are um, not only will be important if there is a procurement of a nuclear power station program and a reactor uh, to replace Safari, but also I suppose in terms of our trade uh, in uh, certain nuclear elements, for instance we need to buy fuel uh, for Kuburg as well as we sell medical isotopes, so those agreements will need to be sorted out in some way. But on the issue of the procurement of the uh, nuclear power stations and the commercial reactor to place Safari, the, the sort of key issue that the ruling raised was around the determinations that were uh, released um, to allow for that procurement process. Now there were two determinations, one that was made in 2013, um, which was actually only gazetted in 2015, and a later one uh, that was actually during the court case. There was a late determination by the former energy minister to allow for Eskom to become the procurer and that was in December 2016. Both those determinations were found by the court to be irrational or, uh, or illegal or unconstitutional and have been set aside. So that really means that there's no basis for either the previous procurement process which would have been led by uh, the DOE as the procurer and then the later one, the 2016 one, which uh, made Eskom and Nexa the agents that would procure um, uh, the nuclear program. Uh, there's no basis for that to proceed. Uh, so in effect what has happened is that Eskom which, and Nexa which subsequently put out a request for, for information and that was issued uh, late last year and the deadline was uh, um, just two days after this court ruling, the 28th of April. Those you know, have to be held up while they've been, they've been halted. So we are basically in a uh, situation where any, anything that happens with regard to nuclear procurement will need to start all over again. What are the immediate consequences for South Africa's nuclear program? Well the immediate consequence is that the process that had been initiated through the RFI which was released by Eskom and Nexa, that has to be halted and uh, we've uh, heard uh, you know, through um, a tweet really from Eskom that that has in, in fact been the case. They haven't put out a formal statement but that the RFI process is now you know, withdrawn until there's uh, legal, legal clarity. A uh, short term as well is that the Minister of Energy has to decide uh, how she approaches um, uh, this ruling. Does, does she, and perhaps also NERSA, because NERSA in the ruling, it was found that NERSA had an obligation to take those determinations that, were, that it gave concurrence to so the, the energy minister uh, uh, wrote a determination, then sought the concurrence of NERSA both in 2013, as I said, only gazetted in 2015, and then again in 2016, and both times got NERSA's concurrence. The judges found that that wasn't the correct uh, thing that NERSA did, that they should have actually had some sort of public participation process 
around that concurrence before they, they signed it off. So it could be a, a case of the energy minister as well as NERSA having to decide whether they take this uh, uh, on appeal. And we haven't heard yet, but I think there is that sort of legal consultation happening this week, and we should hear soon whether appeals will be launched. Um, so immediately, that, that would be the, the next stage. Um, I know there's a lot of resistance to the minister taking on appeal, but I think there's some procedural issues that do need to be, be clarified. For one, that the determinations really arise out of the integrated resource plan. Now, the integrated resource plan, we know the 2010 version basically died on the vine and is very out of date. Uh, but it also set in motion not only the nuclear determination, which was done in an untransparent and unorthodox way, but also the more transparent uh, determinations around renewable energy, gas, and coal, which triggered the RPP uh, program. So the, I don't think the concurrence that NERSA gave, for instance, in the renewable energy um, uh, sector uh, went through a further public consultation process because I think what NERSA would say is that the RP would have been the publicly consulted document and we are just concurring with the, the minister's determination to allow for the procurement process to go ahead. So I think there might be some procedural issues that just need some tightening up and clarity and then I'm not too sure whether the minister also has to appeal around the, the IGAs whether those processes can quickly be uh, sort of sorted out with the respective governments. But I think those frameworks are important to allow for uh, to things to happen uh, but in terms of uh, uh, nuclear procurement and uh, nuclear relationships between, between countries. So there, there's likelihood of a, uh, there's a strong likelihood of appeal that we haven't heard yet, and that would be the immediate uh, consequence or the immediate outcome uh, of this. But uh, whether the, uh, there's a defiance at all, it doesn't look like it. It looks like Eskom's uh, holding back from moving ahead with its RFR, which would have been converted once they had re received those responses into a more uh, sort of commercial orientated RFP uh, request for proposal type process. That seems to be off the agenda for the immediate uh, future. What are the likely longer term effects of the ruling? Well, I think there's a big opportunity for the new minister to embrace this ruling as, an op uh, as, a, as a chance to clear the air around nuclear and to clear the air especially around our energy electricity plan. So now we've had an integrated resource plan from 2010 that is desperately out of date and really needs to be updated, uh, taking in account, into account the changes that are happening in the electricity mix globally. And we've seen, for instance, that, uh, that the renewables technologies that were in some ways quite new and quite expensive when we started the renewable program have come down the cost curve quite dramatically. We also see that some countries are starting to invest heavily in storage, and we've also seen this drop off in gas prices, which does change the equation somewhat for the way you use renewable energy, which we know is intermittent or variable and therefore needs to be backed up either by gas or by some sort of other uh, dis dispatchable uh, electricity. And that's the big advantage of nuclear, it is dispatchable. Uh, when you need it, uh, you can use it, although it, you also can't switch it off. So some people say it's not flexible uh, as, as a gas would be. So we need to have greater certainty and there is an opportunity with this really weak demand profile that South Africa has for electricity. The latest figures suggest that we're back to sort of the 2003-2004 demand type uh, internally. In not ne that's, that's not including what we export um, to the rest of Africa at the moment. And there's a big drive by Eskom to increase the amount of exports. But South Africa's demand is low. We've got this additional capacity that's coming on in the form of the renewables projects initially, but also those big mega coal projects in terms of Madupi and Kasile. We're going to have uh, surplus capacity for some time. So there is breathing space to get our plan in order. Now, whether the plan should be as centralized, that is a central planning type model that we do or, or not, that's another debate. But what we do need is if we're going to have uh, a central plan, we need to have that plan uh, as realistic as possible. And the current 2010 version, which is, is the one that we were going to uh, procure 9,600 megawatts 
of nuclear by 2030 is, is, is really not uh, an appropriate plan for now. So I think there's an opportunity to really settle on, a, on an integrated resource plan this year that is properly uh, consulted in the public, that uh, takes into account a lot of the submissions that have been made over the last few months when the base case was released. Um, and the base case, ironically, well, we found out was not the least cost solution. It had wedged in nuclear into that, even though it had pushed nuclear far back into the late 2030s before we needed the first reactor, it still was included uh, not, as a, not on the basis of being least cost, but on the basis of some constraints that were placed on it. And I think that the, the, the process now needs to focus on um, those technologies that are going to be included in, in the plan need to be justified either on the basis that they least cost or on the basis that they economically um, and technically the best solution for South Africa. So maybe nuclear might not be the least cost, but maybe it can be justified on another basis, um, on the basis that uh, sustaining a, a nuclear sector in South Africa is important and retaining those skills. That's an economic basis, so not on a financial, but really on a, an economic basis. There's, there's benefits all on the stability it offers to the grid. But we need to have a transparent uh, discussion around the costs and benefits of these different technology solutions and we also need to take account of this massive transition that's happening in the uh, electricity economy around the world and we can't close our eyes to that and I think there's been too much of that ignoring uh, both of what is happening around the world and ignoring the, p the, the pleas of the industry for greater certainty and I think the Minister has an opportunity to, to sort of nail these down in the, in the months to come. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis.